Testing engine performance issues can be time consuming and at times frustrating using manual conventional testing methods. But today on the trainer, I'm going to share a few tips on using the Autel scope to speed up that process, make you more efficient and your diagnosis more accurate. Stick around. The trainer is brought to you by Autel. Explore the entire line of Autel diagnostic tools at www.autel.com. When it comes to engine performance, there are really only four areas you need to focus on when you're trying to determine the cause of an engine that isn't running quite the way it should. One is a mechanical problem that is preventing the engine from sealing the combustion chamber or pressurizing the air fuel charge. The second is an inability to breathe, a problem with volumetric efficiency. The third is ignition, that is the ability of the ignition system to deliver a good strong spark consistently and at the right time. And the fourth is fuel. But let me clarify what I mean by fuel. This covers everything from the fuel pump to the fuel injectors and every component related to the operation of the systems. It is critical to engine performance that the fuel system deliver the right quantity of fuel at the right time and in the proper configuration. I mean spray pattern. And because of this, the fuel system can be one of the most challenging to diagnose when a problem does occur. But if we use the power of the DSO or digital storage oscilloscope, mated with a few accessories, we can test these various components and systems operation a lot more efficiently, a lot more accurately, and a lot more quickly. Our subject vehicle couldn't be more appropriate to today's topic. It's a 2021 Toyota Camry, and it uses both port fuel injection and gasoline direct injection. Like every other fuel system you'll work on, both are controlled by the ECM based on a variety of inputs. Now let's consider first what the engine control module or ECM's primary responsibility is. It's all about emissions. More specifically, it's all about the feed gases that are being fed to the catalytic converter. They must be kept in a very narrow lambda range. And that's why the ECM needs to be so precise when it comes to controlling the amount of fuel it's adding to the air being taken in by the engine. The ECM first has to determine how much air is entering the engine by weight at any, any given moment. It uses a variety of sensors depending on the system, whether it's a mass airflow or speed density system, to calculate that amount. Once it knows how much air by weight is being taken into the engine, it can compute how much fuel by weight to add in order to maintain a stoichiometric or lambda ratio. On a port injected system, because of the time the fuel is actually delivered to the engine, the ECM can use on time to control the amount of fuel being added. It knows how much time to open the injector because it knows what the flow rate of the injector is at a specified pressure. On a GDI system, it's a little bit different. Again, because of the time the injection takes place. In a GDI system, there's very little time to get the amount of fuel in there that we need for proper combustion. So we change not on time, but pressure in order to ensure that that full quantity of fuel gets to where it needs to be. One of the things that makes diagnosing a problem in fuel delivery such a challenge is that the ECM determines the amount of fuel required by bank and not by individual cylinder. So if one injector is having an issue, either not contributing its fair share or too much of its fair share, it can be very difficult to narrow that down. 
hopefully I'll show you a few tips and tricks today that can help you do just that. When diagnosing the overall fuel system, I like to start by looking at the fuel pump. Now, these systems, the GDI and port injected systems, today, more important than ever, review the scan tool data PIDs associated with those systems. They provide a lot of valuable information as well. But since the focus today on using a scope, I want you to see what that looks like and how that might help you in your diagnostic process. Now I checked the schematic for this vehicle and I learned very quickly that this uses a brushless DC motor as the fuel pump. Now the old days I would do some current ramping on the brush type pumps to get an idea of not only the electrical health of the pump, but also what kind of work it's doing. Is it pumping too hard or is it pumping too easy? Is it spinning too fast or too slow? A lot of these can provide diagnostic direction. But that doesn't mean we're going to lose all of that because of the difference in pump design. So I'm just as curious as you probably are right now of what that can tell us when we look at it on the scope. Now I've already taken the liberty of connecting to the fuel pump control module. When you look at it on the wiring diagram, it's very easy to distinguish the brushless pump because you'll see wires labeled just you would see on a motor generator on a hybrid. U, V, and W. So that's what I'm connected to. And I'm connected using these special little adapters that came with my Autel accessory uh, kit. Um, it's an, an inline adapter. It allows me to plug in to the connector in series. So I can open it up, put this in series, and then have a very nice place to go ahead and get that uh, scope lead attached to. No, no back probing, no piercing the wires. So I went ahead and did that. Then I'm going to go ahead and hit the uh, measurement menu on the tool. We'll open up oscilloscope, and we'll just start with channel A. Channel A is connected to one of the three uh, windings I'm, that, that I'm interested in, the UVW that I just mentioned. So we're going to go ahead and set this up. Now, you've always heard me say the 2020 rule to start, so we're going to follow that here as well. We'll start with 20 volts, and I'm going to hit set the time to 20 milliseconds per division. And I'm going to adjust that if needed uh, as we go forward with our testing. Now I want to make sure the probe is set as, as a times one, so we'll do the same thing here. Probe setting, yes, times one, straight lead. Uh, again, we'll set that at 20 volts. Channel three will set also at 20 volts. So that's my UVW. And I've also connected a low amp probe to one of the uh, leads. So hopefully we'll get a good current pattern as well. So the fourth channel, I'm gonna go ahead and set that up. Now here I have to go to probe setting and I have to select that, that current clamp that I'm using. In this case, I'm using the one millivolt to, uh, to 10 milliamp range. It's already set up. And again, we can adjust that if need be once we get everything started up. So now I've got this all up and ready to go. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start the engine and let's see what we get. All right, so here's what we got. And it's just a big kind of a blur there, isn't it? So we can adjust that. Um, let's go ahead and increase the voltage. See what that does. We'll increase that to 50. We'll do the same for this channel. Same for C. All right, so now we've got everything, everything there. And uh, let's get a little, little separation. Still light of smurge, so now let's change the time. We'll increase that. Let's go to five milliseconds. Getting better. Go to one millisecond. Getting better. How about 500 microseconds? 200 microseconds. All right, maybe a little too much. 
And this is what you get when you run into something that you've never tried before. All right, to, to get an idea of what this looks like. A little bit better, let's see if we can go to two. And then I'm gonna just, just, just freeze it right there. See what we can see. Um, just for the sake of clarity, let's take and hide B and C for the time being. And we'll move A, A back up a little bit. Again, we'll run. And let's see, we're going to increase the time a little bit. Again, we're just dialing this in. And this is what you do when you've never seen anything like this before. All right, so now we're kind of getting to see something here. Let's freeze that and see what that can show us. What I want to point out to you first is when we look at the current pattern, the gold pattern, you can see where it's changing polarity. It's going up and then down and then up and then down. This is essentially how we're working or fooling that motor and thinking it's getting an AC signal from a DC source simply by reversing polarity. So let's see if we can hide that up and we want to take a, a closer look at A to see if we can see that. Same thing. Uh, let's see if we can bring that down. Uh, I'm going to get this where we can zero it in. All right. And again, I want to play with the uh, Play with the time a little bit. And again, I think if you look closely, this, there's a, a, almost like a pulse width modulation here, but I think you can see how it's going up, from, starting from the right, then pulling down flat, starting to the left. Uh, let's see if we can put a filter on it and clean it up a little bit. Whoop, I didn't want to cut that off. Let's bring that back. We'll just go in here to the uh, low pass filtering and we'll just try that. See how that, nope, that's too much. And then you have to be careful when you're, when you're doing these filters. You don't want to put too much. So we'll go back to that. We'll get rid of that. And, uh, oh, let's try that a little better a little better not terrific but a little better um, now we'll start changing the voltage a little bit a little bit more and I think again you can see how it goes from positive negative positive negative this is how it's operating the motor just like an AC motor is that reverse polarity that that works in tandem with the permanent magnet in the motor uh, the, the appell attract appell, rip, uh, repel attract of the magnetic fields there generated between the permanent mo motor and the stators uh, in there that are being operated of course now by the fuel pump control module if that makes sense to you so what, all we're doing is instead of having an AC component going directly in there, we're taking a DC component and, re, and the fuel pump control module is uh, reversing the polarity and then going just back and forth, as you can see from these captures. So this is what's kind of fooling that to think that it's got an AC voltage component. Now let's put the other two back in there. And what I want to do is I want to, I want to put these on top of one another. All right, so you see I'm, I'm manipulating the pattern because this is something that's even fairly new for me to, to do. So it's kind of cool to see what we can find here. And um, let's see, we, we're going to take B and C off for a minute. And we're just going to look at the A. So the A looks pretty clear. And then we'll go to B. That's not so much. Let's see if we can do something with that. All right, so, oh, that's, that's the problem. I think we did that. So this was my fault, guys and gals. Again, new. 
um, have to put the filter on for all channels. It was my mistake. Okay, so now we got them all. Now we go. Now we got something we can look at. All right, so it took a little bit to kind of home in on that. And I, I, I'm leaving that in this video on purpose because when you're doing something new with a scope or a new system, you're not going to be able to just punch a couple of buttons and pull up a perfect pattern. You, you have to think about using your scope. I made some very quite simple mistakes, if you will, on uh, choosing the, the filtering and setting up the filtering for the patterns. But now I'm kind of happy with what we got. And here's what I really want you to see. Let's see if we can uh, get that in there. I'm going to pull one channel down a little bit, one channel up a little bit. And I don't know if you can notice, make sure the filtering is the same there, yeah, they're all the same. Channel B, channel C, they look very good and they're staggered a little bit. And that's what you would expect to see when you look at an AC pattern, wouldn't you? you if you're looking at a three-phase alternator or a three-phase motor generator, you look at that pattern, you're going to see those sine waves kind of overlapping on the screen. So we're kind of seeing that here. We'll, we'll slowly bring the, the, the green up to the blue and you can see that, that overlap. But here, here on the red uh, signal A channel, something looks amiss. Something looks like there's a problem with there with that winding. So let's go, we're gonna bring it down to the zero line and we'll get some measurements here. But you can see that it appears it's, it's all negative. It's all negative. We don't really have the, that center uh, component like we do on the other two channels, do we? Again, here you can see the zero marks say on both the blue and the green channels. Uh, B and C, you can see how that, that zero line is right down the center and then how it alternates positive, negative, positive, negative there to create, again, that AC effect to drive the motor. But there looks to be an issue with channel A. So we have to recheck our connections. If we still have the same issue that we, we are showing here, well, then there's some type of a problem, isn't there? We'll have to go into that a little further. So now we're going to play with the current. And I want to open it up so we can get a nice clean current pattern. Like, here we go, that's a good clean current pattern. So here's one way that we can take a look at what's going on. Let's go ahead and try that while we're working on this together, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and, and see where, we're, where I have the pattern, on the current pattern, and then we'll go check all three windings and see if they look similar. So right now we've got um, about six amps to minus six amps, either side of zero, nice clean pattern. Uh, a little hashy at the top, really not worried about that. And uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to move it around, let's see what happens. So the first capture was on the, on the blue pattern, on uh, blue channel, I'm sorry. And now we're on the green channel, we're on the uh, C. Okay, we're looking about six and six. Very, oh, we'll get it. Okay. So let's see what we got. We're looking at six and six. M pretty much identical. So that means the third one left to check was channel, what well, was channel A, that suspicious red trace that we saw. Let's switch that around. Now I want you to look very closely. While the current pattern is still reversing, look at what it's reading. It's only three amps, plus or minus. Substantial difference, isn't it? Let's go back and compare that one more time. Three amps, channel A. Moved it over to one of what we known good. Now we're back to reading six amps. There's definitely some kind of issue here that we need to go ahead and dive into. But that's the whole purpose of this video. How quick can we take a look at this system at that pump and ascertain whether or not there might be a problem? What about RPM and speed? Can we check that? Sure we can. What if we, uh, let's see if we can grab some cursors. We'll stop the scope there for a moment. And I'm just going to move them to the center of two up peaks and see what that tells us. 
Look real close. And it's reading 4,850 RPM, about 5,000 RPM for a pump speed. Whether that's good for this vehicle or not, I know that's right around the range I'm used to seeing from a fuel pump at speed. So it seems to be spinning at the correct speed. Current seems to be okay for, for most of it, but it looks like there might be an issue either with the feed going to one of those windings or the winding itself. We'll have to do a little more digging on that. But again, I wanna stress that it's the, it's the ability to look at it quickly with the scope and then follow up with that if you do find a problem. If it looked great, well then we can move on with our troubleshooting. Let's move on to taking a look at the injectors using our scope. Here, the scope can tell us quite a bit about the health and condition and operation of the injectors. Let's start there with port injection uh, and taking a look at that. Now, in this case, looking at the schematic and identifying the injectors, you'll see very quickly there's one common power wire that feeds all four of these injectors, and then each is controlled on the ground side by the ECM. So the color codes for the control side is different on all four injectors. I'm injector number one. I'm on the black wire, which is the ground side control. I also have a, a piercing tool to connect to that wire. And I want to make a few comments about that before we get too much further on. If you must pierce the wire with a piercing tool, make sure that you only tighten the tool on the wire just enough to get your signal. Don't clamp it down like you're putting the wire in a vise. You could cut strands in the wire and lead to a problem that somebody else is going to have to fix down the road. Another thing I want you to be sure of is seal the hole that you made when your testing is complete. Um, you can get liquid electrical tape from most local parts houses. Uh, you can use clear nail polish. Never use silicone to seal the hole. That will just attract moisture and lead to corrosion. Again, creating a problem someone else is going to have to fix. We're also going to look at the current. So I'm on the red, the power side wire, going to the injector. I'm going to measure my current there. And between the two, we can get some ideas of what's going on with that particular injector. So let's start our injector diagnosis with that pattern. Uh, I'll go ahead and start it up. We'll get the scope set up, see what we got. All right, just like before, we're going to start with channel A. And before I get too deep, I want to, I want to say something here too. When you're, when you're dealing with an injector or a primary side of an ignition coil, any solenoid for that matter, you're going to experience what's called a flyback voltage. In other words, this component works by means of a magnetic field. And when that magnetic field is turned off and collapses, it creates a surge of voltage heading back the other way towards the ECM that could cause damage to the computer. It can also cause damage to your scope if your scope is not able to handle that much of a voltage spike. That's why you'll typically have with your scope something called an attenuator. So I'm gonna put this first in series with channel A and then I'm going to connect channel 8 lead to the attenuator. Now we have to go and set our channels up. So again, probe setting. Again, we're using a 10 to 1 attenuator here. So we have to select that from the list. And then for scaling on the, on the voltage, um, let's start with 200 volts. Again, this is the flyback voltage component I'm expecting to see and not the actual voltage operation of the injector, as, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, we have the current clamp on channel B. So again, we'll have to set that, pick the probe that we're using. And then we can set the, the scaling. Let's just, uh, we'll, we'll leave it on 20 amps for now. I can always change that. Uh, time. Time we're going to leave that at 20 milliseconds for division to start. And you can see we've got something on the screen. Very, very little, right? Very small. So let's go ahead and make some uh, changes. We'll go ahead and start with the current first. Let's drop that to five. 
And I'm going to change that time division again. We'll open that up a little bit. And then we need to add a trigger. Nothing fancy. We'll just uh, use the settings that we already have just so we can stabilize the pattern. All right, let me go ahead and shut the car off and we will talk about what we got. Maybe you heard me kind of mumble something about the current level that I was seeing on the scope. A little surprised by one amp reading. We checked on another scaling and sure enough, it's a one amp reading. Um, I went ahead here in the, in the display that you're seeing now and I changed the, the base on the channel so it would make that larger, easier for us to see. How do I know that that current amount is correct? Well, Ohm's law. I just go to the spec sheet. I see that the spec sheet is roughly 12 ohms for these injectors. Plug that into Ohm's law at roughly 12 volts and we get roughly one amp of current to be expected. So now I'm okay with that number. The one amp is just fine. And you can, okay, so what you're looking at here, I want you to look at it very closely. You can see that the channel A, the red trace, that is the uh, voltage that's on the ground side of the device. So it's just like taking a voltage drop measurement, isn't it? Right across that side of the device, uh, the injector. And then the green channel B is my current. So when you're taking a look at these two patterns, See if you can follow along with me. We're going to work left to right and talk about the elements that you see there. Let's start with the voltage pattern first. You're going to see where we're at in terms of voltage going to the injector. And then right after that, we see that it's being pulled to ground. That's when the injector driver has been closed by the ECM. It's the start of the pulse width, the number that you're going to see on your scan tool data PID. Now the end of that pulse width is all the way over to the right where all of a sudden it skyrockets up into the air. That is the end of the pulse width. But is that when the injector is actually open? No, those are two different things. Before we get to that, let me continue with what we're seeing here on the channel A, the voltage side. Now, if you look very closely at that horizontal line between the start and stop, you'll see that it's not perfectly flat, it's slightly curved, slightly curved. That's almost a mimic to the current pattern that you're looking at above it. And that's exactly what's causing it, is impacted by the magnetic field that's being created as that coil becomes saturated and, and the coil is being turned on. So that's what you're seeing there. The other thing I want you to point out is if you look very closely at the turn on point, it's not coming all the way to ground. That's not a bad thing. It's called a floating ground. And if I'm using the battery reference, as I always do, I'm going to see that hover above that, that zero mark anywhere from 0.7 to one volt. It's not unusual. It's an offset to help protect these devices from all the electronic noise going on under the hood so that their actions are not interfered with. So that's why you have a floating ground there. That's okay. If you think you have a problem with the driver ground, well then you need to move your, your ground connection to the ECM ground side in order to get, be in the same place as, uh, as the device is. Make sense? Okay. All right, continuing on on the voltage, we've turned it off, like I said before, when that magnetic field collapses, it creates a voltage surge in the opposite direction. And you can see that spike here, it's reaching, not bad, showing about 32 volts you know, on the scale. Remember, we have that 10 to 1 correction there. So it's, it's, it really probably didn't need it for this scope. Um, and that's that voltage spike we always want to be careful of. It's fine if it's not going to exceed it. I'm okay. But if I hadn't used some type of protection and I got a value higher than what my scope can handle, I'm going to watch that scope module go poof, and that's not a good thing. Now, as it starts to come down, what you're seeing is the magnetic field collapsing and the pin is starting to close, and you'll see as we come down, almost at the base, you can see this little, little hump, little bump in the line. That is the pintle closing. That's when it's closed, okay? If we go back to the current pattern, 
we follow that from left to right, we see it's turned on, the current starts to rise as the magnetic field starts to build, and then you see on that rise, almost near the top, you're gonna to see a small dip, a small dip. That's when the pintle actually began to move it, it open. Where do these really come into play? What if you have an injector that's sticking? Electrically, it's working fine, but mechanically, it's sticking. You can see that as you monitor these pintle bumps, both open and close, to see if they disappear. If all of a sudden they're gone for a bit, that could tell you that, hey, that, that pintle didn't open, that thing didn't move, and now you're on the right track for checking, you know, for finding a problem injector. Remember what I said before, it's imperative that we get the right quantity of fuel into the combustion chamber at the right time and also in the correct um, spray pattern. It's got to be in the right spray pattern in order for it to burn correctly and, and as designed. So this is all little nuances you're going to see because the ECM is, is sending it out per bank, not per cylinder. So we've got to look for, if you have a drivability problem that's really kind of giving you fits, yeah, you start to need to really start peeling back the onion and look at those really fine details. Is that injector opening all the time or is it stuck open, not closing at all? These are all things that we need to distinguish, okay? Now, here's something else I want to try. Uh, if you want to do a real quick check on the injector health, we can do that with current alone. So I'm going to leave this injector connected, but I'm just going to move my amp clamp over here to a little fuse buddy I've already installed in place of the fuse that feeds the injectors. And then we'll go ahead and start the car again and see what that looks like on the scope. All right, so we'll start the scope. And I'm going to really bring the time base up Okay, so you can already see that we've got a bunch of uh, current patterns in there. So now we'll go back the other way, slow it down a little bit. Maybe a bit more. And I'm gonna move the trigger way over to the left, and I'll tell you about why we're doing that now. Now, this is very interesting. I, I have not had any history with this vehicle whatsoever, so I'm a little curious about this. All right, here we got, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five. See, we've got, um, we need to change the time here a little bit. I wanna get both of the voltage patterns on the screen at the same time. My, my beginning and my end point, if you will, and my cylinder uh, rotation, or engine rotation rather. So we'll bring that back up to 20 milliseconds per division. And, whoop, okay. All right, so you can see very quickly on the channel A, I have both injector positions, and on the other channel, I've got some very strange things. Let me show the vehicle off and we'll talk about it. This is very, very interesting, and again, if you're, especially if you're new to using a scope and you've never run into this before, it could just throw you for a loop and have you chasing something that really isn't there. When we look at this pattern, we can see that we have more than one current pattern going across the screen, but every other pattern is consistent with the pattern before it. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? So I have one that looks similar to what we just saw on the single cylinder, then I've got something kind of weird, and then I've got another one that's similar to what we saw on the first cylinder, and then they get the weird one again. You, you with me? Okay, so here's what we're looking at though. It's critical that you look at the schematic and you understand what it is you're connected to. Now, if you look at just the underhood fuse box and you look for the definitions that are inside here or even on the schematic all that says is injector 10 amp fuse but if you go to the schematic you see that 
it doesn't feed just the injectors, the port injectors. It also feeds the ignition coils. So what we're seeing here is the current, because we're at the fuse that's feeding everybody, we're seeing the current from everybody. So I'm going to focus on the injector patterns. I'm only looking at the ones that line up uh, with that number one injector trigger that we have there, or that reference point that we're using rather, and then every other. And you see they're all very, very similar to each other. So what am I looking out for here? If I have a shorted injector, what's that going to do to that injector's current flow? Ohm's law, once again. If resistance goes down, current goes up. So if I have a shorted injector, I should see that very quickly in the current pattern. What if I have an open circuit in the injector and there's no current flowing? I should see that right away in this one pattern. So let's just say I'm trying to diagnose an issue with a misfire on a single cylinder or maybe a pair of cylinders. And I look at the injectors and I see that some of those are reading higher current than they should be. Well, if it's higher current, that's lower resistance. That means a lower magnetic field, which means it may not be strong enough to pull the injector open or hold it open. I think you can see just from what we got done today that the digital storage oscilloscope or DSO or more commonly referred to as the lab scope can offer you a tremendous amount of options when it comes to diagnosing drivability concerns. There's a lot more that I could show you on the fuel system, but we just don't have the time to fit it into one video. However, if you go to the Motor Age YouTube channel homepage and scroll through the lab scope playlists that we have there, you're going to see a lot of different techniques that you can watch and learn and then experiment with on your own to broaden your understanding and your ability to use this very powerful diagnostic tool. Thanks for watching.